So, I mean, it's incredible to see the impact of uh, innovation and technology on the forest-based climate action. But let's think about um, all the land that's already degraded and deforested. We need to restore that. And, and what is the role of technology and innovation in that process? And on that note, I invite the, the second panel to the, to the stage. Please, please join me um, to, really, to really talk about in a huge amount of detail how, how we should go about ecosystem restoration and the role of technology and innovation. We'll just wait a moment for the, for the panel to organize themselves. But, uh, and we also have a keynote from Tom Crowther, who is joining us virtually. He was going to be here, but he, he got ill at the last minute, unfortunately. So I will pass to Mr. Khalil Walji, a senior scientist and coordinator from C4 ICRAF. So please uh, take over the moderation. Thanks, Khalil. Perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, wow, it's very loud. <laughs> welcome to the second technical session of the day uh, here at UNFAO. A warm welcome also to those of you who are joining us online. Uh, as we come together to celebrate how innovation and technology are revolutionizing how we protect, use, and in this specific session, how we restore forests and degraded ecosystems. Uh, as I was introduced by Julian, my name is Khalil Walji. I have the pleasure of being your host for this concise but very exciting conversation. Uh, we'd like to couch our conversation this afternoon and actually frame it around the key barriers that we face in the ecological restoration space. Uh, and more importantly, we want to spotlight our wonderful assembly of panelists who are joining us in person and also virtually online from governments, NGOs, academia, and from local communities to share how their innovations are driving effective restoration on the ground. Um, the panel will speak to a host of technological innovations. I think it's been clear from the presentations this morning, uh, outside in the atrium and also the previous session, that technological innovation is critical. But we've asked them also to speak about their social innovations, their new conceptual approaches, partnerships that challenge the status quo and creatively imagine a new pathway to work with nature for our benefit and for the benefit of communities and individuals within them. So to kick us off this morning, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker who's going to share with us how his work is helping to grow a restoration movement. Uh, our colleague earlier, Rebecca Moore, did a wonderful job of introducing him already, but I'll add just a few more words. Uh, Professor Thomas Crowther from ETH Zurich is the former chair of the advisory board of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, and in 2021 founded Restore, an online platform that provides ecological insights, transparency, and connectivity to thousands of local conservation and restoration efforts across the globe. Tom, thanks for joining us and over to you. Thank you so much for having me. I'll just share my screen. Hopefully you can see that now. Yeah, I am unbelievably devastated that I can't be there. I've got to say, I'm so jealous. It looks, it's a spectacular event on a spectacular day. Um, but I'll start with a quote. Stephen Wright said that to steal ideas from one person is plagiarism. But when we steal ideas from loads of people, that's just scientific research. That's what the basis of research is about. It's about great ideas, but then it's about building consensus around those ideas so that society can move forward. And there's no place that we need that more desperately than with nature. This magical system that sustains all of us is on its knees. And what's even worse is that at this very moment in time, there are people marching in the streets of many cities around Europe marching against the latest protection law. And that's understandable. They're doing so out of fear that nature will come at the expense of agriculture, at the expense of jobs, at the expense of the economy. But what's so painful is that those are the things that are most, most desperately dependent on nature. And so it's critical that we need to build this consensus understanding that can pervade through society to tip these marches in the opposite direction. That's what we try to do in our research group. We work on building consensus among academics by pulling together insights from data uh, from, from experts all across the planet, trying to understand the status of biodiversity on the planet so that we can also understand how we manage ecosystems in the fight against biodiversity loss and climate change. A lot of that is focused on the magic of the below ground world, like the fungi that literally shape the functioning of above ground ecosystems. We've also done a lot of work with the global soil microbiome to understand how it 
they, those microbes essentially govern the largest and most important terrestrial carbon stock on land. But by far our most controversial work is focused on this, the global forest system. And I'm going to talk briefly about our failures in this, in this area, but also some of the learnings that we've had in the process. Because until recently, we haven't known much about the full scale of this system until these satellite technologies emerged in recent years. And a few years ago, we showed that our Earth is home to just over three trillion trees, a staggering scale of this, of this global system. We did get some criticism at the beginning because people said we missed the trees in the Vatican City, so we've had to update the number. But three trillion and 12 is still a lot of trees that we have to manage on this planet. And these models don't only show us where trees exist now, they can show us where trees naturally would exist. And that means that we've, we've, uh, we can understand that we've almost halved the scale of the global forest system and we've depleted what's left. But these models also help us to see that outside of urban and agricultural land and the regions with low human footprint, there's about 0.9 billion, almost a billion hectares of land where trees might naturally be able to exist. And in those lands, if we could protect them and conserve those ecosystems in the long run, there's the potential for a trillion new trees to exist. Now that word trillion trees, that little alliteration, picked off a terrifying movement because that those forests, if they could grow to maturity, would capture just over 200 gigatons of carbon, which was pretty terrifying, you know, an enormous scale of this potential, a third of our climate needs. And when the information hit the headlines, it went absolutely terrifyingly viral. There were good things that came out of it. A few months later, this decade was launched as the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. WWF launched their Trillion Tree campaign, followed by a similar uh, Trillion Tree initiative by the World Economic Forum. Governments and companies really started upping their pledges of commitment to biodiversity and restoration. But unfortunately, many others also saw it as an opportunity to greenwash this terrifying concept that has undermined this entire movement really was characterized in this paper. Unfortunately, the paper never mentioned planting trees. It has nothing to do with vast monocultures. But when this when this alliteration hit the headlines, unfortunately, planting trees everywhere became synonymous with this idea. And it really led to damaging impacts for the climate movement because people saw it as an opportunity to just plant trees and ignore the challenges of cutting emissions. It was devastating for the biodiversity movement because these are not natural ecosystems and they don't support the biodiversity that we need. And it gave rise to an academic controversy that has really undermined the environmental movement. And when I say undermined, I pretty much mean that I just got, you know, destroyed online. But really this led to headlines that rather than focusing on the immense potential and power and value of nature, they were focusing on the risks of restoration done wrong, which is you know, these headlines are absolutely correct. Greenwashing is devastating. But it's worth mentioning that the wrong trees in the wrong place is absolutely a, foundationally un a foundational uncorrect statement. But it's also true of literally every other innovation. In fact, every other thing that has ever existed. If you put a toothbrush in the wrong place, it can do a lot more harm than good. And so we needed not to fight back against these headlines, but instead to work to revisit those numbers building consensus among hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ecologists with data from millions of forests, well, just over a million forests across the globe. And this gave us a new scale of understanding in terms of the global forest carbon storage potential. It helped us to get a more robust understanding of the scale of carbon storage now, but more importantly, by linking up a range of different approaches and linking up satellite data with ground source data, we could get a more robust understanding of the potential. And this showed us that in fact, we weren't overestimating in 2019, we were even potentially slightly underestimating the potential. 226 gigatons of carbon storage potential in our forest is staggering, but it cannot be, be achieved by vast monoculture plantations, as we all know, because the power of nature is in its complexity, where every species depends on others to survive. And that means that if we were to do this with vast monocultures, we'd be losing 50% of our productivity across this system. So yes, diverse forests can help us with a third of our climate goals, but only if we also cut emissions. Over the last five years, there's been a terrifying amount of controversy or, or debate, dispute between should we cut emissions or should we promote nature? We categorically need both, because if we don't stop our emissions too, 
then fires and floods and droughts are only going to deplete the potential of forests further. We need emissions cuts for our climate, for our nature goals, and we need nature for our climate goals. And this time when the headlines came out, I was relieved and overwhelmed with joy that it didn't go to chaos. But I was even more excited that the scientific about the scientific feedback that this gave clarity and confidence around the role of forests. As I said, it was foundational and correct, but my favorite quote by far was from our most critical scientist in 2019, who summarized the work of 250 scientists over four years as reasonable, which was a massive victory on a scientific perspective. And ultimately, this means we're building this consensus process. And this was the most valuable thing in the process for me is immediately after that paper was published, we were contacted by our colleagues in Brussels who were negotiating the EU restoration law. And they said that this consensus is what gives them the momentum to really move forward and push that, that uh, their negotiations ahead, which was incredible. But unfortunately it brings us now back to the bigger challenge that we're facing, which is what I mentioned in the first slide. Currently people are en masse marching against this law and against the protection of nature because they are scared that nature and forests will come at the expense of agriculture. Now, what's really devastating is that, in fact, this goes against every ecological principle we know. The Holocene period is stable because of the existence of biodiversity. It has allowed humans to flourish because of the existence of forests. If we lose the Amazon rainforest, we lose food production in North and South America. And it's this either or concept that was the same challenge we were fighting in the climate movement quite recently. It must be, we have to change this narrative rather than or we need agriculture and we need nature because the two are dependent on one another so that people can thrive. And I was unfortunately a couple of days ago on the phone to someone, one of those same politicians who was in tears about the fact that there is no tangible scientific consensus showing this very simple fact. We've got thousands of studies showing how we need complexity of nature and biodiversity to have agricultural systems, but we have no quantitative global scale of this, of this relationship. And so the, the sort of next stage of consensus building, I think we believe that we desperately need is not only to understand the critical importance of nature in our climate regulation. We know that about 34% of our climate regulation has been depleted by the loss of nature. We need the same thing for our agricultural production. As we've lost nature, recent estimates suggest that we've lost up to 41% of our agricultural efficiency. And we can do the same thing for global water security, disease protection, protection and our global economy. And as, we, as these black lines move further and further from the edges, we can see them getting closer and closer to the tipping points that are so dangerous because they are the, the points from which it'll be difficult to return. But what do we mean when we talk about the restoration of nature? Obviously, the first thing in terms of global restoration is protecting what we have. This is vital. It means governments and companies looking internally at their own organizations, their own supply chains to end deforestation. And then, of course, we must revitalize what we can through sustainable management, restoration and the distribution of wealth to local communities on the ground. It's not just about banging loads of trees into the ground and hoping they grow, because in many cases they simply won't. I was recently in a conversation with my friend who asked me which trees he should plant in his garden to, to restore biodiversity. And I asked, why can't you just let the trees recover? And he said, oh, unfortunately, my dad mows the lawn every month, so there's no chance. And it was almost halfway through his sentence that he realized that restoration doesn't mean planting trees. It means removing the limitations to ecological recovery. Those limitations can include the microbes. We've shown globally that across the world, when the healthy microbes are in that degraded soil, then restoration can happen 64% faster. We need animals. When, when we have the animals moving into degraded regions with the flow of nutrients and um, spores, we get 38% increases in the restoration potential of those ecosystems. But obviously, the most important is people. It's the people that live in those regions that determine the status and potential of nature in those areas. This is overwhelmingly the biggest failure in the past when people misinterpreted what restoration means. They thought it meant buying up land and planting trees or, you know, ultimately restoration on can only ever work when it is driven by and empower empowering the people who live in those regions. When the stewards of nature are empowered by our economic flows, that is when we see ecological recovery at large spatial scales. This is a this is not an ecological challenge. It's a humanitarian challenge. It is about the equitable distribution of wealth on this planet. And so for to just to end, 
I'm going to introduce the tool that was mentioned earlier, Restore. This is the third of the massive consensus building collaborations that we had amongst ecologists. Those same 250 scientists I mentioned earlier have been collaborating to build this tool to essentially try to distribute the flow of energy towards these local stewards of land ra rather than to the large mass plantations that were so synonymous with restoration a few years ago. On Restore, it's essentially, it was originally, we call, it, we call it the Google Maps for restoration, a place where you can find and engage with the restoration movement. You can also think about it as like an Airbnb for restoration because you can really engage with every one of these actors. Or what happens, you know, Google empowered us here by enabling us to have the technology to build this, this tool that anyone can use and immediately gain insights into the carbon, the water and the biodiversity in their land. And if I give you a couple of examples, I'm sad I didn't choose the example from Adrian Laitoro, who's on the uh, on the panel today, because his is one of my favorite possible examples. But I've got another here, which is Desta. Uh, and as you zoom into Desta's region of Ethiopia, you can see the footprint of agriculture, of coffee production. But in Desta's farm, you can see that it's different because that's just a, that's a natural looking forest. And that's because that's almost as exactly what it is. He plants coffee plants underneath the canopy of an existing forest, which captures water and nutrients so that he doesn't need fertilizers or irrigation for his plants to grow. On Restore, he gets access to the species that grow there. He can get carbon and water mon monitoring from lots of the amazing satellite tools that we've heard in the previous session. But most importantly for him, he just gets trans he gets connectivity to his customers. So when you go into his shop, you can see Restore on the iPad there, and you can see that your coffee is having a positive footprint, not a negative one. And as of September this year, he'll also have the seed buyer complexity score, the first measurement of the ecological integrity at any location across the planet, showing the closer you get to one, the closer that system is to its very natural, biologically complex state. And you can go into a shop and you can scan the QR code on his products and you can immediately see where that coffee comes from. And hopefully, well, he believes that this is driving greater and greater economic gains for his, for his farm and for his wider community. Because when nature becomes the economic preference, that is when you cannot stop it from thriving across the landscape. But this isn't just for the, this is built for the individual farmers, but collectively we can also, oh, actually, sorry, collectively, it is a mass movement. We now have hundreds of thousands of these, these local community-driven initiatives across the planet. And when, they, when we have such transparency across such a scale, we now are starting to have the potential where we can look around individually and find the products that we'd like to source, whether it's a holiday or a coffee or anything in between. And that means we are getting individual engage, engagement. But this engagement can also happen en masse. We can build portfolios because every individual farm from this community in Indonesia is having a, a relatively small footprint. But collectively, across this entire floodplain or watershed, there's a huge, staggering footprint on biodiversity and on carbon storage, with 20,000 tons of carbon storage in the soil. And it's for this reason that the UN Decade chose this community as one of their flagship initiatives, receiving considerable now financial support to facilitate restoration across the landscape. And with so many projects around the world, we are now able to study the state of global restoration. So we've built this white label tool now for the FAO to monitor uh, the national level biodiversity reporting. For every country around the world, you can click on that country and gain all the insights about the types of practices that are happening across all of these restoration sites. You can get all of the monitoring of biodiversity and carbon and water, which can hopefully be useful in that reporting for, for the CBD. But it's also fantastic for telling stories like this story of Costa Rica, where the payment for ecosystem service program distributing wealth to landowners across the planet has led to tangible increases in tree cover and biodiversity across the, across the landscape. And that has corresponded with increases in economic gains and growth at a national scale. More evidence that when nature becomes the economic preference and when we distribute wealth in an equitable way, that nature and people can thrive together. So this is now really the power of, of, of Restore is nothing to do with its ecological data. The power of Restore is its community. We now have over 200,000 individual local landowners who are promoting nature in their, they are the stewards of nature across the globe, which now means that we can study the scale of this restoration movement for the first time. And in, I think, I think six days time, 
uh, we have a paper, the first paper based on Restore coming out. So this was Susan Cook Patton's group studying the climate impacts, the local climate impacts of these restoration projects, showing that they're having a cooling impact in 84% of the global system. So 84% of these sites are cooling their local climate conditions, which is so critical for local climate adaptation in a warming world. And what, one of the most frequent questions we get about Restore is, what do we do when we're investing in nature? What do we do about all the projects that have gone wrong? And my answer is pretty simple every time. If these are truly community-led projects, then I think we should invest in them even more. These are the projects that need even more commitment. These are the ones that need time to get it right. And these are also the ones that we can learn the most from. We cannot be shaming the failed projects. We have to be encouraging them and championing them as heroes so that we can have full transparency and learn about this collective movement. Jack Handy said that before you criticize someone, you should walk a mile in their shoes. His reasoning wasn't quite the same. His reasoning was that, so then when you insult them, you'll be a mile away and you'll have their shoes. But ultimately we need to move away from this critical and uh, competitive nature of the environmental movement. Climate change is making us terrified and that makes us antagonistic and competitive. Whereas ultimately what we need is the equitable distribution of wealth on the planet. The one place where our global scientific consensus is already crystal clear is that when nature thrives, then people thrive. And it's only when we have this harmony, harmony built back into our systems that we will all collectively thrive together. So thank you very much. Big round of applause for Tom Crowther. Tom, thank you very much. We regret you weren't able to join us here in person. We know you're not feeling your best, but uh, thank you for bringing tremendous energy and excitement to kick off our panel. And we know you also need to run to another panel. So best of luck there. And uh, uh, yeah, our best wishes as you celebrate International Day Forest. Thanks so much. Another round of applause for Tom. Guys. Thank you very much. So as we kick off our panel discussion, and I'll introduce them one by one as we go uh, along, um, I want to come next to Yelena Feingold, who's the restoration officer here at FAO's Forestry Division. Y Yelena, we just heard from Tom how they're utilizing the power of technology to scale restoration actions as a contribution to the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. It's spearheaded by the UN agencies, but it's been embraced by governments who have recognized the need to accelerate all of these efforts through a powerful 10-year drive. So. Can you tell us what's new? What's new with the UN Decade? What is the work of you and your team? How have you guys been innovating to support effective restoration? Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Khalil, for turning on my mic and for that question. Um, that was a really inspiring presentation, Tom, and the session before. Wow, there's so much to absorb. Um, and about the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. So the UN Decade is really meant to uh, get people excited about restoration, to engage everyone in the protection and revival of ecosystems. As Tom mentioned, we have you know, those two important elements. Um, and for the benefit of both people and nature. Again, both are really key there because we can't have restoration without engaging and supporting the communities that live and benefit from the nature. So in the UN decade, it really aims to halt the degradation of ecosystems and restore them to achieve global goals, such as the global biodiversity framework from the CBD. And FAO leads the, the UN Decade with UNEP, and we convene two task forces. Those are the task forces on best practices and on monitoring. And these are collaborative and innovative um, efforts to engage actors from across society. And we have a nice sampling of uh, these actors in our session today. We have governments, we have international organizations, we have researchers, we have NGOs, and we have uh, UN agencies that are all engaged in restoration and working together. In the monitoring task force, we're really looking at what data is available on restoration and how we can break the silos so that data is aligned and that when different stakeholders collect data, they can put it together to get the bigger picture of restoration efforts. And um, at FAO, we've developed the framework for ecosystem uh, 
the framework on ecosystem restoration monitoring, we call it the firm. And that really connects those data flows. It aims to work across platforms and connect those data and remove that competitive element that Tom mentioned from data, trying to make it open and, um, and interoperable, as we say, and to assist the government reporting process to the Global Biodiversity Frameworks target to restore 30% of degraded ecosystems by 2030. And we're partnering with organizations like Restore, like IUCN, to harmonize data that they have on areas under restoration, making it easier to share that data across platforms to increase transparency and facilitate that re um, reporting process. And, um, and Tom, and we're really excited also for, uh, for these partnerships. Tom showed we're thinking about how to package the data from Restore, how it can be useful, how we can make sure there's quality data and that's um, in a transparent manner. And today we actually just signed a, an agreement with uh, Restore well, where, where we will be working together on that. So we're really excited to announce that. And um, just to wrap up, the, we know that the climate and biodiversity crises are here, and there is an urgent need to upscale restoration efforts, and we really need to break these silos and bottlenecks and facilitate uh, effective restoration actions. Thanks, Khalil. Over Thanks, Elena. So a number of innovations you've mentioned there, collaboration, partnerships, uh, an intersectoral working group uh, through the Best Practices Task Force and the Monitoring Task Force. Of course, and then the launch of a new platform, the Framework for Ecosystem Restoration Monitoring, um, contributing to this global exercise of trying to figure out where restoration is occurring and at what quality. Um, I want to come back to you, though. Um, we, we've heard this morning around, uh, about the tremendous strides we've made in improving what we can see in the sky, but we, we also understand that there remain barriers and challenges to working on the ground. Can you, share, can you share some of your thoughts on that? I mean, there was also mentioned in the previous session the launching of this new tool, Ground. So what kind of innovations are you guys seeing for restoration to be tracked to, to um, the, the actual practitioners on the ground and how they can actually report information up? Yeah, thanks, Khalil. And of course, we know restoration, it happens with actions on the ground. And it's important that that restoration is done right. And you know, as Tom mentioned, um, it's not only about planting trees, but it's important to get the planning, implementation, and monitoring to make those trees, to make sure those trees are actually uh, driving change that restores our forests and other ecosystems. So um, in the UN decade, we're disseminating principles and guidance for effective implementation of, um, of ecosystems that, of course, maximizes the benefits to both people and nature. The task force on best practices, they recently published um, a document called the standards of practice to guide ecosystem restoration. And the, this includes 300 actionable recommendations that are applicable to all types of ecosystems and restoration projects from voluntary community member led pro um, projects to national national scale projects and it really aims to assist restoration implementers with developing national projects that reflect the principles that are defined in the un decade for equitable restoration and then in terms of uh, monitoring restoration, it's important to know first where restoration is happening. And that might sound a bit simple, sure, you know, you restore, you know where it's happening, but many projects, they don't keep track of that, both small and large scale projects. We find that monitoring component missing. So we're trying to really shift, to have a cultural shift there in terms of um, making sure that there is spatially explicit data available on where the restoration actions are happening and what ecosystems are being impacted. And in, in the firm, the Framework on Ecosystem Restoration Monitoring, uh, there's a registry where the, area, um, the areas under res restoration are geo-referenced and uh, the information that's collected there is consistent with the requirements for reporting under the Global Biodiversity Framework. 
We're also now piloting a connection to ground as uh, Rebecca launched today in her presentation and we're really excited about this. Um, and ground, we're piloting a linkage between the firm and ground. So it will be a simple tool that facilitates collecting data on restoration areas in the field, on the ground. Actually, Adrian here was uh, one of our first testers of ground in uh, the user group in Kenya. So that's really exciting that he's also here today. Um, and, and then once that data is collected, it's important for us to have um, open and transparent data. Um, we have, we've developed a search engine in the firm where you can search good practices and initiatives which aim to foster mutual learning and knowledge sharing among re restoration stakeholders worldwide. It, de it demonstrates our collaborative innovation of sharing information across platforms. And today we're also really pleased to announce the um, launching of the firm initiative search engine where we've um, now also connected to the UNEP WCMC's Nature Commitments platform. So you can uh, consistently search restoration initiatives across those two platforms, as well as restoration good practices that are entered into the firm, WOCAT and Panorama Solutions. So we really hope that through the transparent sharing of restoration actions, we can really inspire and upscale the restoration movement. Thank you very much, Elena. That's very innovative. Um, I want to turn the floor next to a virtual panelist, a virtual panelist, Mr. Chetan Kumar. So I'll ask the technical team if they can bring him up on screen. As they do, there he is. Welcome, Chetan. Chetan is joining us uh, virtually, and he's the head of the forest and grassland team at IUCN. So Chetan, we've, we've heard from the restoration barometer before, and it was originally launched alongside, of course, the Bond Challenge, but has since expanded to working with over 20 countries mm -hmm. and tracking both terrestrial and non-terrestrial ecosystems. Um, I think at current, around 14 million hectares of land are pledged under the barometer. So over to you, can you share some insights on how IUCN is working with countries on their ecosystem restoration efforts? Uh, what's innovative, what's new? Uh, over to you. Great, thank you, Khalil, and hello everyone. Good afternoon there and happy International Day of Forest. Uh, it's really a pleasure to join this panel representing IUCN and I'm delighted to have this opportunity to share insights into our work and contribution to the field. Um, IUCN, as many of you know, one of the world's oldest organization, environmental organization, has crucial role or has been playing crucial role in global ecosystem restoration movement for the past two decades. We have been col collaborating closely with the countries to provide them the support, uh, the necessary knowledge, capacity building, and innovative tools for success. Um, if I have to summarize our approach in three words, um, drawing from or borrowing from our uh, one of the German government pioneers, um, I would use pledge, plant, and proof. So the key initiative as part of the pledge is the bond challenge, which was launched in 2011, as many of you know, by the German government and IUCN. This global effort aims to restore 350 million hectares of degraded land by 2030. Participating countries have already committed to over 240 million hectares, and we are confident that by 2030, we will achieve this target working closely and in collaboration with not just countries, but several partners here as well. Then the next question comes in, how do the countries identify the most impactful areas for restoration? And this is where our innovative restoration opportunities assessment methodology or ROAM comes in. So by working closely with the countries and bringing all these innovative tools, knowledge, and also an important point that was highlighted earlier, engaging with the stakeholders to identify and prioritize. Um, you know, one aspect is the scientific, uh, you know, knowledge on uh, what area to be, you know, restored. And the other aspect is the community and you know local stakeholders' preferences. 
Rome, what Rome does is to bring these different streams of knowledge and address and bring uh, develop consensus on how and where to restore. And Rome has so far helped to identify over a staggering 500 million hectares globally. I mean, again, I'm talking about work. This is the this is the number based on the collaborative efforts with the countries. And then the third one, the proof part, is where the restoration barometer comes in, which goes a step further. It's not just about pledging to restore the land, but about achieving measurable progress. And the restoration barometer provides a framework to track the area restored and the critical benefits of biodiversity, carbon sequestration, improvement to local communities. So the barometer helps countries transform their commitments into real world results. And let me give you an example um, of you know, taking the case of Rwanda. Rwanda pledged 2 million hectares to bond challenge in 2011. Rwanda used Rome to identify high priority areas within its diverse ecosystem to implement this pledge. They, they used high resolution map and using the data driven strategies they were up, they came up with a very effective restoration planning and, and and have been implementing that plan as a result of this by 2022 based on the data submitted to barometer over 600,000 hectares of land in Rwanda are already under restoration and these interventions have focused on creating and expanding crucial buffer zones to safeguarding biodiversity while repurposing and restoring degraded areas into thriving national parks so in Rwanda's success story demonstrates how IUCN collaborates and facilitates countries in ecosystem rep efforts with the right tools and knowledge. Thanks very much, uh, Chetan. So working across the gamut from the beginning of planning restoration, implementation and monitoring, and you highlighted one of the key IUCN tools, the RON, the Restoration uh, Opportunities Assessment methodology. But I, I want to hear from you once more. Um, at the beginning, I mentioned that we'd like to couch and frame our discussion this afternoon on the dominant challenges. So in, in your perspective, can you share with us what is the key challenge that IUCN and, and the barometer team have confronted when working with countries and how is, um, how is the barometer actually tackling that challenge? Great question. Thanks, Khalil. Um, so yes, um, uh, I would focus on three uh, main challenges, uh, or rather four. Um, Let's combining you know the fragmented data and lack of unified approach makes it very difficult to track and analyze restoration progress across countries. And we have heard a little bit about this earlier, but also if you work in the countries and many of those uh, you know do, you know gathering data and collecting from the ground, you have experienced this. The second aspect is the capacity gap. You know stakeholders involved in restoration projects often. Well, they are aware, familiar, but they require training and, and support on how to do this. And that's where a lot of our effort go in with working with our country offices, with our partners, with our members to support the capacity. And the third challenge I would say is the reporting overload, which I'm sure many countries and we all like several reporting requirements, different approaches. How do we bring those under one umbrella? And this is where Restoration Barometer provides this uh, solution to some of these challenges. One, of course, it's a unified platform, provides a single accessible platform for detailed monitoring, reporting of restoration efforts, holistic tr you know, tracking and minimizing reporting overload. So just not just reporting on the area of restoration, but tracking core benefits like carbon sequestration, biodiversity improvement. And as I mentioned earlier, building capacity of the stakeholders. Let me give you an example, Khalil, um, uh, from Sri Lanka. And uh, Sri Lanka has included restoration target in their NDCs. Um, they aim to increase their forest cover by 32% by 2030. And they have found restoration barometer very, very useful um, to report and collect data. And so far they've already reported over about 5,241 hectares of restoration by 2022. So by addressing these challenges, we are trying to help countries on reporting progress um, on restoration efforts. Terrific, thank you so much, Chetan. I'd like to invite our next panelist to join us on screen. So I'll ask the technical team to bring up Ms. Fabio, Fabiola Zerbini. 
as they do, I can introduce her. Fabiola is the director of the Forestry Department in the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change. There she is. Hi, Hello. Fab Fabiola, I wanted to, uh, before I turn the, the microphone over to you, I wanted to pose to you two challenges and two questions, of course. We, we've heard that, or we know now, that 115 governments have committed to restoring a total of around 1 billion hectares of land. But we also understand that the roots of degradation lie within our economic and our political systems and require innovations to better connect and coordinate the government to tackle both insufficient funding, but also to give restoration efforts more political priority. So my first question to you is, how is your ministry innovating to ensure policy coherence across sectors and to better align public incentives for restoration? And then I think building off of what Chetan mentioned, this idea of fragmented data being a key challenge. We know restoration actors lie within the governments. There's um, civil society actions which are taking place. Uh, the, the private sector as well is, is also um, is, is also conducting restoration efforts, but all of this data and the mandates for this data sit within different platforms and with different ministries as well. So the second question then is, how are you leveraging collaboration to ensure coherence in data reporting so that we can truly tell a holistic picture of restoration? Over to you. Thank you so much. First of all, good morning, good afternoon for all of you. I would love to be with you guys. Uh, but today, as you should know, no, the Forest Day, Celebrated together with you is a very, very, uh, uh, it's very honored and happy, you know, but we will also have many other events here in Brazil, considering uh, the relevance of the agenda. Uh, and this is, I think it's also why, no, I'm not together with you all. I will share my screen just to bring some, some, some visual support to what I will uh, tell you in terms or trying to answer. Now, and I ask it to answer both questions together because uh, I really see uh, a real connection and the vision of the current national public policy revision process, but also implementation process, uh, also sees that the social and the technological or the technical innovations uh, are needs to be combined to really move forward in a different way to solve old problems. <laughs> so how to really make difference you know, to guarantee that the targets uh, and the urgence you know, that the targets is also addressing will be really um, achieved. Uh, let me share my screen and confirm with you that if you are all seeing this. This is okay? Yes, we can see your screen, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So uh, let's start by bringing the, the overview of how we are dealing with the revision process of the Brazilian restoration public policy called Plena Vegi or Pro uh, It was launched in 2017 and it was the moment where Brazil assumes the commitment uh, to restore 12 million hectares by 2030. Since then, uh, a lot of things happening, but you also see you now we the current uh, government or the current mandate you know, uh, resumed the process. And in 2023, we start resuming the process of the implementation and the revision of the public policy by restoring the public private governance body. This is very important because we understand that to really guarantee that the policy will be not only uh, better planned, you no, know, but agreed and, 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 and validated uh, by public and private actors, but also implemented on the ground. This is a country uh, or even more a global you no know, policy that it's not only a responsibility of the environmental ministry or the federal level. So we really need to bring together people and to uh, uh, engage them on a building collective process. Uh, so Conavegi was resumed last year. More than 60 actors now is participating. From January to June, we are holding more than 20 mini meetings and we are focusing the revision in three, three main pillars, special intelligence and monitoring. This is exactly what I will focus more here, but we are also talking on the restoration economy or the economy of restoration, now investments and also the supply chain, how to really move forward on that and implementation arrangements, which means what will be the, the, the priority packs of uh, innovative tools that we will put in place to really guarantee the achievement of the 12 million hectares. July, we will put this plan, the new plan, uh, under a public consultation, all of you is invited, and then October we will launch it, together also with the NBSAP, Target 2, and other 
uh, uh, information about how land use can contribute to the NDC. No? The monitoring system uh, will be really launched you now in 2025, but this is very crucial. Uh, all the planning process is more than important to really guarantee that the monitoring system that will put us in a different level no, of transparency and accountability with the society and the global one um, will be really launched on 2025. What is new in terms of the social uh, uh, innovations? No? Uh, when it was created in 2017, the national public policy didn't count with a strong movement from the ground that now we do have. We have six very strong networks in each biome, Brazilian biome. If you look here in the slides, I put it some photos, some pictures, no, uh, and it, it it shows to all of you, no, the, the how how diverse our biodiversity and our uh, landscapes are, and each biome has a non, um, not only network of local actors but also. Uh, uh, challenge and opportunities. So bring the alliances, the biomedic alliances, as we call here in Brazil, to the revision process or the building process of the public policy, but not only on this, also on the implementation of the public policy. I think this is uh, one of the key innovative uh, approaches that we are bringing to to the whole to the whole process, and this is also not only on a political support, but also on a monitoring local governance really contributing to the monitoring system, but also economic perspective. So how can we use the networks, the local networks to really optimize the flow of investments, to really optimize the engagement of the subnational governments with the federal governments, um, combining public and private partnerships. This is, I think, the key. And all of this has been discussed through the revision process that I showed in the time frame. this like that I showed before, but also uh, inside different uh, other places, no, and and projects like GAF and and whatever. So uh, on the technical side, first of all, all the technical, and I'm really support what Tron, what Tom brought to us. No, I we do agree the Brazilian government nowadays really sees that the monitoring systems is also. Uh, uh, part of the building a local governance. So it's not only a technical issue, but the combination of this, uh, uh, the technical and the social innovation is also crucial to guarantee again, the transparency and accountability. So the first, first layer is uh, Terra class as we are calling now. So how to really bring uh, remote sensing strong uh, data, an official one to show how we are dealing with land use in Brazil. What is being deforested, but also what is being regenerated, like the secondary vegetation, and how can we monitor this through the years? You know? This needs to be a continuous uh, remote sensing process, but it needs to be connected with other local uh, and different systems. You know? And I just brought three here, but we should also engage others. Uh, but these three are the main ones who are working with us to really build this new interop, inter, I don't know how to say it in English, but you understood this new uh, uh, platform that will combine all the systems. First is CICAR. We need to combine the mm, restoration monitoring with the implementation of the forest code monitoring system. This is an official system. Uh, this is where all the Brazilian rural properties uh, brings your own data in terms of how they are uh, organizing their land uh, and their property in terms of forest, agriculture. Uh, and this is where the re environmental regularization plans will be registered. So this is a way to really understand how the environmental regularization, so how the implementation of the forest code is contributing to the restoration targets achievement of the country. The second one is um, what we call a CENIMA in Portuguese, but this is a system that it's, is, is lead by IBAMA. So it's very connected with common and control and also connected with all mandatory uh, restoration um, uh, actions and projects and real initiatives that we have to monitor. And this needs to combine some local uh, um, uh, monitoring as well, not only remote sensing, but again, in an interconnected way. 
and also the social and the, the restoration observatory, which is also a, a FAO partner or restore partner. Um, but this is where we will connect also the, the, the data from the ground. And the good news about the social the, the, the restoration observatory, which is a private initiative, uh, is that as much as we could connect the official ones with the private ones, we will guarantee that the local governance and the local networks and alliances will really, really contribute, bringing their own data, but also keeping, you know, like looking and protecting their own territories in favor of the common goals of the restoration. So this is what I have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Fabiola. Some wonderful reflections, I think, to leave um, our audience here. Uh, for me, uh, the most important thing you said was we need to have a movement on the ground. And this really, uh, I think, dovetails nicely with what, with what our keynote, Tom, said, is, is that this is not an ecological challenge, but this is a challenge of humanity. I mean, I this leads us to, to the key message, which is we know that the real work, the real work will take place on the ground. Uh, by harnessing the potential of indigenous communities and local communities and working with them to accelerate their work. And so I'm excited that for our final panelists, we're joined by Mr. Adrian Litoro, a Global Landscapes Forum restoration steward and the founder of NAPO, Nature and People as One. So Adrian, your innovation is you're leveraging the power of your own community, of the Rendile and the Samburu communities in northern Kenya to restore dryland forests. So can you tell us a little bit more about your work and your innovation? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think to begin how to explain the work that we do, we have to kind of understand the context that we work in. So the particular area that we work in is a dryland forest. It's called the Mount Marsabit uh, forest. This is found in the Horn of Africa, which maybe you've had had the longest drought, a five year drought. And so this just shows the importance of this dryland forest. So. Uh, it's important one for biodiversity, but also the communities that we work with our communities. They this is the last this is the last uh, the dry the the fallback area for a community that is a pastoralist community. It's a nomadic community. They rely on the land. So our approach is based on governance. We recognize that the local institutions and governance by local community institutions. So there's a lot of knowledge within uh, these institutions. Everything that happens within the community or, or any decisions that are made have to go through these community institutions. So our approach was more of a listening approach. Start off by recognizing that the solutions are probably already uh, existing within the landscape and work to support these solutions. So the idea is have a conversation we then look at what would work, what has worked. Uh, and from there, you know, uh, these community institutions would be able to implement what is their priority. In this way, then you have really more effective, more, uh, more impactful, and most importantly, I think, is it's not prescriptive, right? A lot of the work that we do sometimes can be a bit prescriptive to the communities that we work with. It's supporting what has come out and learning together, right? Because uh, some of these lessons, they worked some time back, but this is a changing, we have climate change, we have uh, biodiversity loss. So it's not the same. So it's learning what works and heavily supporting what works so that we can be able to have effective uh, and of course inclusive, most importantly, restoration and community-led uh, conservation. Adrian, with Napa, you guys are, I mean, you've, you've just outlined how you guys are working within community structures, traditional community structures, but, but you're also combining that with the use of technology, yes, to, to better track landscape health and also um, leveraging their inherent knowledge of wildlife behavior. Can you speak a little bit about the Herder Conservation Network, which I think is a new innovation that you guys are piloting? Mm. So, the, so the Herder Conservation Network was, came out of us realizing that Herders, we, who are the pastoralists that move around with uh, livestock, there is no one who understands the landscape better than a harder. They live throughout their whole life uh, in the landscape. They've grown in that landscape. They have huge knowledge about how it works. And they've always been excluded from rest conservation or restoration. So basically what bringing in tech the power of technology and traditional ecological knowledge, the power to make decisions and make more effective you know uh, our the solutions that we are proposing 
this is what the Hada Conservation Network is all about. It's the young people, these are young people who uh, have definitely not gone to school, but they still have the, we understand that the knowledge that is there, that is present, should be able to contribute to the stewardship and uh, the solutions that we're trying to, to source. Thank you very much, Adrian, and congratulations on your terrific work. Um, colleagues, please join me in thanking all of our panelists who have joined us remotely online and here in person. We can give them a round of applause. We thank them for sharing their ambitious efforts, and also uh, I know that I've been inspired by their work, so thank you very much. Um, we are quickly running against the clock, and I would hate to steal even a minute of your coffee break. Um, but before we conclude, we do have a special feature to share with all of you. On the recently selected World Flagship Restoration winners, I believe we have a film, so if we could roll that. We are lost this balance of the healthy ecosystem. More and more area is covered by step fires. Satu abrasi yang luar biasa hingga desa-desa itu banyak yang tenggelam. Unless we understand that this will be getting worse and worse. But uh, that doesn't tell the whole story. You can see this as uh, the front line against climate change. Wild ungulates such as Saiga, their intermediate grazing pressure helps to maintain such habitats. It's the same needs, the same approach. So we need to act together. Este es mi hogar. No hemos perdido la esperanza. Restoration flagships are the most ambitious and promising cases of large-scale restoration we can offer. It's an opportunity to be recognized and celebrated for your efforts and scale your work further to inspire others and attract more catalytic funding. Does that sound like you? Or someone you know? <laughs> the UN Decade has announced a new call for flagships with at least 10 new projects being selected and announced in 2025. So if you're an innovator, a restoration champion, or know someone that is, you can nominate them before the 30th of April. The links are being shared across all the platforms now. And with that, I think that's the end of our panel. And I will turn over to Julian to send us off to coffee. Let's uh, give them another hand. That was incredible. Thank you. Yeah, that was really, really inspiring. And I, now we pause. We get to take a breath after an intense couple of hours. But I hope we're starting to convince you that, in fact, foresters are very innovative. <laughs> I think we're getting there. So here in Rome, we're going to pause for a, a much needed uh, coffee break. Online, please be back at four o'clock Rome time and uh, we'll continue with the same incredible energy. While you're getting your coffee, I want to call your attention to six photographs that are on, the, on the, that side of the atrium. They're winners from the uh, International Day of Forests photo contest. And they're images from Austria, Finland, Honduras, Lebanon, Slovenia, and the United States and they showcase innovation and forests. So we received 200 entries from over 40 countries and the six winners were chosen by a jury of professional photographers and they're on display for you to, to have a look at while you're having your coffee. Thank you very much. Uh, please be back here at, at four o'clock seated and we'll continue with the same great energy. Thank you very much.